Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Biofluid-Based Biomarkers for Neurological Disease. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Biotechni. To learn more, visit bio-techni.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I would now like to welcome our speakers. Yoav Noam, PhD, Assay Development Manager at Biotechni. Dr. Hayretin Tumani, scientist and professor at Ulm University Hospital, Department of Neurology, and Dr. Stefan Halbegauer, postdoctoral researcher, University Hospital, Ulm, Department of Neurology, Institute for Experimental Neurology. Yoab, I'll now pass it over to you to get us started. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Kaylee, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So um, I'll start right ahead, considering we have a lot to cover today. Um, my talk, as you can see on the title, uh, has to do with precision biomarker detection, and specifically, I'm going to focus on how an automated immunoassay platform can really uh, push the boundaries of biomarker detection. So before going into biomarkers, just a few words about our company, Biotechni. As you can see in this graphic, uh, there are quite a few products and product lines uh, under the roof of Biotechni. Anything from ELISA kits, proteins, antibodies, instruments, and many other technologies. And really, the overarching theme is to empower research, empower research for clinical diagnostics by providing the robust tools. And I hope, hope that the presentation today will help serve as a kind of a demonstration of that to a certain degree. So let's jump right on to uh, biomarkers. So biomarkers have many different definitions. The definition that you see here on the screen is a very narrow one, but it's, I think, suitable for today's talk in the sense that you can think of biomarkers in the uh, realm of, of uh, biofluids as any protein or even a molecule that can inform us on the physiological state of its donor. Um, when we uh, think about biomarkers in the neurological space, uh, and specifically about biomarkers in biofluids, there's been a lot of research recently, both uh, in blood and in CSF. And you can already think about the utility that biomarkers may have for diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment, uh, or evaluating the eff efficacy of treatment uh, across multiple neurological diseases. So rather than going uh, deep into that, that will be covered in uh, the rest of the talks in this webinar. What I'd like to talk today about is how. How do we detect and how do we measure biomarkers in biological fluids? Um, looking at, you know, decades of history, I think one of the most common uh, methods to quantify uh, biomarkers in biological fluids is ELISA. ELISA is uh, a method where, that utilizes antibodies that are specific to the molecule in question. You can see here in this example, a typical microplate uh, coated with a capture antibody. And the capture antibody can, as the name suggests, capture and bind to the analyte uh, of interest. Then in this particular example, we see what we call sandwich ELISA, where it's secondary uh, antibody, a detection antibody, is bound to the analyte from another site. And the detection antibody is bound to a reporter molecule that essentially what it does is emits light, either through chemiluminescence or fluorescence. And that light is correlated directly to the concentration of the analyte in the sample. So it can tell us the uh, quantitative measure of this analyte in the fluid. So as you can see here, this is a widely used method, right? 12,000 publications per year. It's been around for over 50 years now. And as most of us can imagine any method, but definitely a method that's been around for so long, uh, does come with some drawbacks. So what are the drawbacks of uh, ELISA? Uh, for anyone who has performed it, uh, you can uh, easily tell that it's quite manual. 
could be laborious. It's several hours of work, a lot of uh, washing of the plate, tapping, applying reagents, applying antibodies, washing again, and so on and so forth. Uh, for that reason, it is quite difficult to scale it up to large amounts of samples. And for the same reason, also, it creates variability, right? Uh, different users might do it slightly different. Um, you could also have a chance for human error introduced during these uh, multiple steps. Um, another issue with ELISA that may arise is the fact that many of the ELISAs out there are non-standardized. So if you think about your favorite analyte and you want to measure it, there might be quite a few protocols out there, quite a few ELISAs, antibody pairs. Some of them are fully validated, some are not. So it becomes really difficult to compare across labs and across sites. And lastly, ELISA could be wasteful. Um, some of the biofluids that we're interested in could be quite precious. Uh, imagine, for example, CSF from uh, a disease donor. Um, so we want to be very mindful in how much um, volume of that sample we use, and we want to preserve it as much as possible. So for these reasons, you know, uh, we thought uh, we would like to, to think about it a little differently. And what I'm going to show you here is ELA. ELA is a microfluidic, uh, fully automated platform uh, that performs this immunoassay in a closed system. If you look at the right, you will see uh, what it means from an investigator perspective. From the experimenter perspective, uh, what you do with ELA is you take a cartridge. You can see it on the right uh, with multiple wells. You need to scan a barcode, you add your samples, you add wash buffer, and you insert it into the ELA device. And all the rest happens completely automatically. All the rest is hands-free uh, within 90 minutes since the beginning of the experiment, you will get your results. And on the left side, you can see a whole bunch of um, advantages that come with this uh, platform. And the reason is mostly due to the fact that it's fully automated, right? Because it's fully automated, you eliminate the user or the human aspect of, of the assay. Uh, there are also other advantages we have to do that have to do with the microfluidic design of the platform. So rather than going one by one here on this checklist, I'd actually go ahead and simply demonstrate some of these principles. So how does it work? What you're seeing here is a typical cartridge uh, for Ella. Uh, it's a little bit different than the cartridge that you just saw on the previous slide. And the reason is these cartridges come in different formats. Some of them allow for 16 uh, samples. Some of them can uh, allow for more. And that adds to the variability and the versatility of the platform. In this case, we have a cartridge where you can apply up to 16 different samples. And each one of them will be measured in uh, across four different analytes. So if we flip that cartridge, and if we look at the bottom, you will see a micro, microfluidic circuit, quite small. And this microfluidic circuit, which, which I'll zoom into, has those very, very tiny three little dots that you can see, which are now highlighted here. They look like dots, but they're actually nanotubes. Um, there are glass nanotubes, which we call GNRs, glass nanoreactors. And this is really where the so-called magic happens, right? So if you look into the GNR, which is depicted here on the left, the tube, um, you will see that the GNR is coated uh, with capture antibody. A sample will flow through this tube and the ELISA will take place inside this GNR in a completely automated manner. You can also see on the right that there are three GNRs for each channel, meaning each analyte will be measured in triplicates within the microfluidic circuit. So let's take an even deeper dive into how it works. So what you're seeing here is uh, a representation of a GNR within a microfluidic circuit. Um, the sample just flew into uh, the various uh, channels. You can see that in gray. And again, everything that I'm uh, depicting here basically happens automatically within the script of the device. So once the uh, analyte is inside, the sample is inside the GNR, it will be a slosh back and forth, which you can see here. And the analyte will bind to its specific capture antibody. Then what we need to do is to remove all the excess protein, which is being done by a series of um, sloshes of wash buffer, which is in the cart. 
And the next step would be to apply the detect antibody. In this case, because the cartridge has four different analytes, they are um, depicted in four different colors here. And pay attention to the fact that through a series of valves, we can completely isolate those different channels from each other so that the detect antibodies for one analyte will not interfere or interact with detect antibodies for a different analyte. This really adds to the robustness of the platform by avoiding cross-reactivity across um, antibodies. So here's the secondary antibody binding and creating the sandwich uh, with the analyte. It is washed away. And the next step would be to apply the dye. The dye is fluorescently tagged. It will bind to the detect, it will wash away. And finally, the last step would be a laser that is existing within the uh, device will uh, simu stimula simulate, stimulate and uh, result in emitting light from the fluorescent fluorophores. This will be measured by the device. And uh, the last thing that you will see will be the results, right? So this just, uh, it's the last step of the ELA uh, run. And as you can see here, what you get immediately is all the information that you need. You will get three readings for each analyte and you will get the actual concentrations. And the reason that you can get the actual concentrations without any need of calculation or fitting curves is because uh, the standard curve is embedded within the cartridge. This helps both standardizing the assay as well as making it simple and fast for you uh, to use. Um, and also, if you look here at the column with the CVs, coefficient of variance, you can see that the uh, coefficient of variance are, are typically very low at a single digit. Uh, and that is, again, due to the microfluidic and automatic nature of the device. So, so far, I've shown you how this can make life easier, right? Simpler, you don't need to wash, you don't need to do all these multiple steps in a manual manner. But there are many more advantages to using this platform um, on a microfluidic Setting. Uh, what you can see here on the left is a comparison of two standard curves that were obtained with ELA in blue compared to a traditional ELISA in orange. And the first thing that you notice is that the ELA has a much better sensitivity and dynamic range compared to a traditional ELISA. This is something that we see across many analytes and across our assays. And it really helps making a difference because in this case, you can see how samples, which are depicted uh, with the blue and the orange circles are detectable on one platform on the ELA, but are below detectable threshold for the other. This has actually been verified uh, in a clinical setting, or at least with clinical samples. Um, and um, this is what you're seeing here on the right. On the very right column, healthy, um, you can see the IL-6, which is interleukin-6, very low abundance protein, um, distributed across many donors around the one, two, three picogram per milliliter. Note the uh, logarithmic scale on the y-axis. But if you look at uh, patients, uh, for example, prostate cancer patients on the left, you see these values can go all the way to 1,000 and over picogram per milliliter. And because the dynamic range is wide for ELA, you don't have to worry about it. You just apply your sample in the same dolution, and you will get the results either high or low. They will be reliably quantifiable by the device. Another perhaps even more um, perhaps even more um, obvious way of uh, thinking about the advantages of an automatic uh, microfluidic platform is the uh, notion of increased precision, right? So in this slide, you can see how um, the same sample, this is a neurofilament light assay, actually we'll talk a lot about this during this uh, webinar. Uh, the same sample was uh, prepared many, many times and run across multiple sites, in this case, three sites. And you can see how the distribution of these samples across sites, no matter where they were used by, uh, run by the same user or at different cartridges or on a different ELA machine, uh, the precision is high. The coefficient of variance here is below 10%, which is quite good for inter-assay uh, precision. Uh, and this is something, again, that we see across assays and across analytes. So 
Ella has currently over 250 validated assays, which are available on those multiple um, cartridge formats. You can see here on the lower uh, left side uh, the various research areas that these assays um, are involved in, anything from inflammation, oncology, nephrology, neuroscience, and various other fields. And uh, when we look into the neuroscience, some of the existing assays are neurofilament-like, neurofilament-heavy. We have a GFAP assay for CSF samples, and uh, we're quite happy to announce that uh, amyloid beta 140 and 142 have just been validated and they will be available uh, in April 2023. We're also working on several other analytes, uh, tau, phosphatau, neurogranin, uh, GFAP in serum and plasma, and various other uh, assays. So stay tuned for that. Lastly, um, we also have many of our assays, including the interleukins and cytokines, um, validated in CSF. So for those who are interested in neuroinflammation studies, um, some of these assays are already fully validated in CSF. You don't have to do any extra work on your end to make sure that they can work for that sample type. So uh, with a minute or two that I have left, I just wanted to highlight uh, one or two assays that we have on our platform. One of them we'll talk a lot about during this uh, webinar, so I will go very briefly over. This is the neurofilament, uh, and we have neurofilament heavy and neurofilament light assays available on ELA. They're pretty widely used. Um, here on the left side, you can see a demonstration of how they can be utilized in ALS patients. Both in serum and CSF, you can see the um, pretty marked increase in a neurofilament light uh, with ALS patients. Um, we've seen a, a lot of usage of these assays um, in the past several years. Um, the uh, NFL and FHR assays had 22, 25 peer reviewed publications just in the last year. Uh, more are coming out this year. They are uh, very useful to uh, detect uh, neuronal injury. Um, across various neurological conditions. And just to go over a few highlights from very recent publications to those for those interested, uh, there has been a two, tw 2023 paper, um, a commutability study with quite a few uh, researchers in the field that combined uh, forces, if you will, and uh, tested NFL assays across multiple platforms, including ELA, including other platforms that you might know, Olink, Simoa, um, Siemens, and uh, yeah, I encourage everyone to read, those who are interested, I encourage to read this paper and to appreciate the high reproducibility that these assays have across platforms. Uh, there have been also several um, direct comparisons of our ELA assays with other platforms such as Simoa. So this is on the right side and um, more are mentioned here at the bottom. So um, feel free to read those as well if that's your interest. So to conclude, um, what my presentation hopefully was uh, trying to show is that using an automated immunoassay solutions, we can increase precision, robustness, and the sensitivity of assays across analytes and biomarkers. Uh, the automatic, automated nature of the device help accelerate workflow, increase throughput, and avoid uh, the user introduced variability that is inherent to ELISA applications. And finally, several neuroscience biomarkers on ELA can uh, really uh, provide the required sensitivity and utility for biomarker research across neurological conditions. Uh, and they can be also combined with additional assays on ELA menu. So I will uh, stop here and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And um, I'll be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Yoav. Before we get started with our next speaker, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in a poll question here. So you'll see this question on your screen. Please submit your answer. The question asks, what technology are you currently using to measure neuroscience biomarkers? So please take a moment to submit your answer. Again, the question, what technology are you currently using to measure neuroscience biomarkers? Great. All right. Well, thank you for your participation. I will now pass the presentation over to Dr. Chumani.
So I hope everything works well and my camera and my audio functions also. Thank you, Kaylee, for this nice introduction. Thank you, Joaf, for your excellent talk. And um, my part will be now to um, share with you the topic on uh, biomarkers, biomarker research from the perspective of a clinician, of a clinical scientist, clinical neurochemist, and a neurologist. Um, we already we already heard. Um, okay, just a moment. Excuse me. So oh, I think this is the correct way. Okay, you already heard um, what the definition of a biomarker is, and this is here an older one. Um, actually, everything in in biology um, and and in medicine could be a, a biomarker. And uh, here on the next slide, uh, you see uh, what the uses of biomarkers could be. Uh, and on this uh, lower figure, you see the uh, different uh, areas. Uh, it could be used in preclinical uh, stages uh, to uh, assess at risk population. Uh, it could be used at, as a diagnostic tool uh, at uh, initial clinical uh, onset for early diagnosis to, to define um, early stage of disease uh, and uh, also to stratify uh, disease groups. It could be used um, for, uh, in, in case of, uh, to determine the future cause of a disease once the diagnosis is established or to uh, monitor current disease state. Uh, this is more the diagnostic part and it has also, uh, you can use them also in treatment outcomes, uh, especially uh, if you uh, intend to uh, develop uh, new treatments and to uh, assess the uh, treatment response. Uh, and so uh, the most important thing where biomarkers uh, could help us uh, in clinical routine and, and, and in clinical trials and in, uh, in studies is that uh, the biomarker uh, can be a, a read, significant readout uh, for, uh, in case of therapeutic uh, intervention before the clinical endpoint um, has reached and the clinical endpoint could be in in, in uh, chronic diseases um, it could take very long time we, we will not have uh, and uh, to save this time a biomarker could show the uh, effect of a therapeutic intervention that's why it might be very very helpful and in uh, almost all clinical trials and different kind of diseases biomarkers are meanwhile um, uh, standard um, readout parameter, usually uh, uh, secondary outcome parameter. Um, here uh, in our uh, university and, and clinic, um, as a neurologist, uh, we are dealing with, with uh, lead biomarkers uh, extensively. And to uh, work with biomarkers, you uh, need uh, to have uh, different areas uh, to, to deal with. Uh, not only that the patients are important uh, cohorts, but also you need to have the biosample, uh, biomaterial bank, uh, which uh, we uh, talk today about uh, CSF and, and serum mainly, but there are, of course, many other biofluids where biomarkers can, uh, can be looked at. Uh, so this is uh, the first what I'm going to uh, concentrate on. Uh, so the basis for biomarker research is, uh, is a very uh, standardized sampling of uh, defined controls and quality control of, of, of samples. And this um, uh, requires uh, SOPs, uh, which uh, include the beginning of the sample um, withdrawal whether CSF or, uh, or blood, uh, up to um, how to do the, the, the lumbar puncture and all the pre-analytical steps, the timing, uh, and so on and so on. This is summarized in, in a 
consensus report, uh, which was uh, published by Charlotte Toynesen several years ago. And uh, uh, the same importance also is uh, how to define uh, the controls uh, for the diseases you are looking at. Um, and this is also something very uh, important. Um, if you sh want to uh, show uh, importance of a, of a biomarker in a specific disease, you need to have appropriate uh, controls to show its uh, specificity. Um, and then the biosample bank um, in Ulm, um, it, uh, it is important once you uh, collect the samples uh, that you uh, have, of course, uh, informed consent um, uh, for the biomaterials uh, that are of interest to you, and then define the cohorts and controls. Um, and uh, of course, include uh, a phenotyping uh, uh, of the samples, uh, not only clinically, but also by uh, imaging and once the samples have been collected and uh, are transferred to the to the laboratory uh, they should be also processed in a standardized way and this is the way how we do it here in our clinic um, how the aliquoting and the biobank software uh, which is uh, and the database that is that is used uh, and um, these are the uh, we use uh, minus 80 up to minus 150 uh, freezes uh, with alarm system and um, of course a specialized biobank personnel and here you see uh, our three uh, technical assistants uh, that uh, take care of the biosample bank and are very very uh, devoted uh, to it. So now uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about um, CSF sample. Uh, usually the CSF sample is taken by a lumbar puncture, as you see in the figure below here. And where does it come from? The, the, the CSF is in the ventricles and in the uh, lumbar CSF space. And uh, the adult usually um, produces half a liter uh, in a day and uh, usually um, 10 to 15 uh, mils or cc is taken, which is, uh, can be renewed within half an hour. So it is not a big issue, but um, it is important to uh, sample enough volume because the lumbar puncture is not that, uh, done that frequently as, uh, as blood. And uh, so the, this, the CSF that uh, uh, we, we take uh, by lumbar puncture uh, comes from the central nervous system uh, compartment. And it is, of course, um, separated within the central nervous system compartment by, uh, by barriers. And two different barriers um, are there uh, uh, that we have to um, distinguish. We have the blood-brain barrier and the blood-CSF barrier. And here uh, you see in, in this uh, blue part of the figure where the um, CSF is located and it is separated by the blood-CSF barrier and, um, and, the, um, and the blood barrier is only uh, separates the blood compartment from the uh, brain parenchyma. So, if we take the blood, uh, if we take the CSF, then uh, we are we have to deal with the blood CSF barrier and not with the uh, blood brain barrier. This is important to distinguish. And uh, here in one of our uh, papers, uh, we have summarized what the uh, anatomical and physiological differences of these uh, barriers are. But in the literature, it's it's usually mixed up uh, and that's why I'm mentioning it here. Um, and what is the composition of the CSF? Is it the only a brain liquid? What uh, the original idea uh, was? Um, if we look at it uh, from the perspective of uh, proteins, uh, then uh, uh, our knowledge from today is that 80% uh, of the proteins of the CSF 
are actually um, uh, originating from the blood compartment. Uh, so they are able to pass the blood CSF barrier into the CSF space. Only 20% are originating from the central nervous system uh, compartment from the, from the brain and the spinal cord. And these 20% uh, are made up um, by correlate plexus proteins and only less than 1% of this uh, brain-derived proteins are actually uh, brain parenchymal uh, uh, proteins like neurofilaments or GFAP or tau protein. But uh, the, it, is, it is a very low concentrated, but uh, uh, with immunoassays uh, at the range of uh, at the, at the diagnostic uh, analytical sensitivity of uh, uh, of nanogram and, and picogram, uh, you can pick them up. So um, I told you already that um, the CSF samples and, and stream samples um, require a, a phenotypic characterization, and this includes also uh, a neurochemical characterization, neurochemical phenotyping, and whenever we collect uh, CSF, samples for our biosample bank, we, we always do um, a routine uh, CSF analysis, which includes uh, cytological parameters, protein analysis, uh, albumin, immunoglobulins in CSF and serum oligoclonal bands. And uh, depending on the, uh, on the question of the clinician, also uh, uh, pathogen-specific antibodies and uh, also um, CMS-specific proteins, for instance, uh, markers for Alzheimer dementia. And here are the parameters. And uh, at the end, uh, we always try to put all these findings together into a so-called integrated total result, where we, we are able to um, assess whether an inflammation is going on, what kind of inflammation, what is the CSF, blood CSF barrier, function uh, uh, about and uh, and so at, at the end we can um, uh, more um, or, or better more reliably uh, do an interpretation of these results so uh, even uh, if we have a, um, a question on um, uh, neuro neurodegenerative diseases like dementia we always um, uh, do use or do, do conduct this um, CSF analysis to rule out other inflammatory diseases and, uh, and, and from there uh, then to continue uh, to the CSF uh, positive biomarkers for um, neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, here um, now um, I will talk a bit about the, the biomarkers uh, in routine and also uh, uh, about the newer biomarkers uh, for neurogenetic diseases. And uh, I will uh, try to focus here on one uh, neurogenetic diseases, which uh, we, um, in, in our clinic, in our department, uh, which represents uh, one main um, scientific focus. This is the uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, where uh, biomarkers uh, can be used to, to establish early diagnosis and to uh, uh, assess the, pro the prognosis of the disease cause. And I will focus here mainly on the uh, neurofilament. And um, so what are the, the neurofilaments? Uh, the neurofilaments are neuron-specific structure proteins that they make up uh, uh, more than 10% of the neural proteins. And uh, here you see uh, different uh, subtypes and uh, isoforms, uh, five different subtypes. And in, in routine, um, we usually use the light chain neurofilaments and the heavy chain neurofilaments. Uh, and um, now nowadays we um, use the heavy chain neurofilaments by ELISAs in the CSF and the light chain. 
uh, in the blood. Um, so, and now uh, I will share with you some uh, data first, uh, CSF data uh, of neural filaments. And neural filaments, uh, I mean, are now uh, uh, we are experiencing a real hype. Uh, the the uh, publications on neural filaments have been. Um, exponentially uh, rising in the, in the past uh, five years, maybe. But new filaments are actually not that new. They have been known for some decades, but only uh, they were detectable in CSF first. And we uh, started to um, work uh, on new filaments uh, almost 16, 17 years ago, at that time using an in-house Eliza together with uh, Axel Petzold um, and Johannes Bettschneider uh, were the first author of this paper on uh, in ILS. We used the heavy chain uh, neurofilament and uh, look at ALS and uh, Alzheimer dementia compared to controls and so that especially one of these neurogenic diseases, the, uh, the ALS, shows a significant uh, uh, higher levels, not only compared to the controls, but also compared to the Alzheimer. This was, this was uh, a bit of a surprise because two diseases are neurodegenerative diseases um, with the neuronal uh, edemis, but uh, obviously the um, heavy chain neurofilaments represent only the axonal damage, and that's why they are uh, typically increased in ALS only. And we looked also uh, to see whether the progression of the disease makes uh, a difference on the uh, NFH level. And we saw the patients with rapid progression had higher levels than those of the, the slow progression. And um, so 10 years later, um, commercially available ELISAs uh, were there. And um, also from our clinic, a different group uh, from Marcus Otto, uh, where also Stefan Hartkewa is working with, um, repeated this uh, uh, the, the study uh, with a, a larger amount of samples, and uh, they so exactly um, could confirm the results from uh, earlier. And here uh, uh, they were able to uh, differentiate uh, or to correlate the level of uh, heavy chain neurofilaments uh, with the survival time of the uh, ALS patients. Uh, the shorter the survival time, uh, the higher uh, the higher the um, neurofilaments level were. And here you see on the left the data from the light chain uh, in the CSF. Um, so the heavy chain was um, able to separate better and we were able to um, define a cutoff, which we still use uh, uh, in the routine analysis. And uh, so how specific are neurofilaments uh, for, for ALS is the next question. And actually they are not specific at all. They, they are a biomarker for neuroaxonal damage, but not a biomarker for, different, uh, for special uh, diseases. Um, and here you see in this uh, diagram that uh, different kinds of neurological diseases might be associated with elevated um, neurofilaments in CSF. And the same is also true if we look uh, to it into blood, but this is a little bit later. But uh, still, uh, there are differences. The highest levels uh, are seen in uh, HIV patients, AIDS patients with cognitive impairment, and then uh, uh, FTLD and, and, and ALS, but many other degenerative diseases are also uh, in the in between, also uh, uh, mildly elevated and even um, inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis may also show elevated um, levels and they do correlate with uh, inflammatory activity and have also prognostic value, which I'm not going to show here but I will focus more on the degenerative diseases on ALS, but I just wanted to show you that the neuroaxonal damage uh, happens in different kinds of diseases independent of, uh, of the etiology. 
and here we are sticking on MF, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis because this is the disease with the most extensive neuroarsenal damage. That's why uh, the neurofilaments uh, are um, here a very um, appropriate uh, biomarker. And now, uh, of course, um, the uh, technological uh, advancement uh, uh, like the ELA platform or the Zimor platform allowed us now to uh, detect the neurofilaments also in blood. We do not know how the neurofilaments actually get into the blood. Uh, we, I told you about the barriers, the blood CSF and blood brain barrier. And uh, between the brain and the CSF, there is not a real barrier. So between the extracellular parenchymal uh, uh, space and the CSF, there is not real barrier. That's maybe the explanation why the CSF has a high concentration. And the blood um, uh, composition of with neurofilaments probably uh, uh, it, it might uh, uh, it might uh, tra uh, be transferred uh, by the uh, by passing the blood brain barrier or it might um, pass the uh, CSF uh, blood barrier the other way around. So we don't really know exactly, but it is possible to detect it. That's the important way, important thing. And here are the different platforms that allow us to uh, detect neurofilaments and other uh, CNS-specific um, biomarkers, proteins uh, at the femtogram uh, per mil level. And how do the um, data look like uh, if we stay with ALS and if we uh, measure them in serum, not in CSF, and we see it's uh, the same performance with regard uh, the sensitivity and specificity and here we were able also to find the diagnostic sensitivity of more than 80 percent and a good specificity so that um, serum analysis uh, is uh, enough to get information about the neuroaxonal damage happening in the central nervous system so this is so far uh, so good but how about the uh, reference ranges, uh, what uh, do we uh, use to, to report? Um, and are there any um, uh, influencing factors that need to be um, uh, considered? And uh, here uh, we see um, um, very important uh, that uh, the age, there is an age dependency. And uh, these are all uh, the reference values and depending uh, on the age, the uh, upper uh, values or upper cutoff in the age group up to 18 is uh, uh, seven picograms. But if we are uh, in the age group of 70, uh, the the, class, the cutoff um, in the the cutoff will be five times higher at 35. So this is uh, uh, important to know uh, and to, to report the, the reference values uh, dependent uh, of the age group. And uh, a way to report it is also to use uh, percentiles, curves, as reported here by Michael Khalil uh, two years ago. And uh, another possibility is also to use uh, set scores. Uh, set scores. Um, is uh, uh, resulting from uh, the standard deviation of the uh, normal values. And here you, the blue ones are the normal ranges, the gray ones are the set scores up to 1.5. Uh, and here the other categories, set scores, uh, the yellow ones up to two, and the red ones uh, represent set scores above two. Um, and if you uh, use this um, kind of um, reference range evaluation, you see that is, um, of course, uh, of advantage uh, uh, as compared to the fixed cut of values. For instance, if you have a 20 years old um, patient, uh, its cut off will be, upper cut off will be um, here around, around seven and the value of 10 uh, which is usually used as a cutoff, could be also incorrectly high. And for an older patient, uh, a cutoff of 10 
uh, could be falsely low. So that's why it's it's uh, important to to use this way of uh, reference range. And this is now my last slide. So I tried to give you an example of a, a red biomarker representative uh, in case of uh, neurofilaments uh, in a specific uh, neurological disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And the red biomarkers that we use here uh, almost for several years now, in case of neurofilaments, they are well standardized and easily and cost effectively uh, uh, measurable. And uh, they already have their place as uh, endpoints in, in trials in different diseases, not only in ALS, but also in multiple sclerosis and in uh, Alzheimer's dementia also. Um, and that's why they are, I think, uh, very, very helpful for us. I would like to thank you for your uh, attention and uh, thank uh, the people who do the work here in our department to develop biomarkers and to uh, measure the um, routine analysis and uh, to uh, take care of the biosample bank, which you see here all. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Tumani. What a great presentation. Now, before our next speaker is going to present, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in another poll question here. This question asks, what are the top three biofluid neurological biomarkers that are the most critical for your research or work? Please submit your question into that open text box there. Again, the question asks, what are the top three biofluid neurological biomarkers that are the most critical for your research or work? I'll give you a moment to answer this question. Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, with that, I would like to now pass it over to Stefan to begin his presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kaylee, for the nice uh, introduction. Thank you, Hyrton and Joff, for your uh, great presentations. I will directly jump in and uh, focus in my part on the practical part in the laboratory from the view of a biomarker uh, developer. And um, you already seen here my first slide in both of the talks uh, previously. So biomarkers are highly important for neurological diseases, but only not, only not for diagnostics, but also prognostic staging. And here on the right bottom side, I wrote clinical trials. So also this is coming more into focus as we can now measure blood um, biomarkers using highly sensitive automated assays um, and this can be then more important for therapeutic trials on of effect of uh, drugs on for example any kind of readout and um, what kind of um, biomarkers do we have so um, this is of course only a selection um, from Alzheimer's disease, we know total tau, phospho tau, and the beta peptides. They are used for several use in CSF, and they are more into focus again now, as we have the techniques also to measure them in blood. But I will more focus on some other markers, some emerging markers, but also the neurofilaments, which are, I guess, not that emerging anymore. They are really used uh, widely. Um, I will talk about a bit how we implemented the neurofilaments in our clinic. How did we set up those automated and highly sensitive assays? Um, and then I will also talk about how do we develop new assays and we will concentrate on GFAP, an astrocytic marker, and on beta synuclein, a presynaptic marker as uh, Synaptic loss um, seems to be really also an early phenomenon in, in neurodegenerative diseases. And if we have biomarkers for this, um, this could be highly valuable. So what do we do when we um, like to implement or 
um, yeah, established novel assays. So either uh, we, we have knowledge of the disease and we know what we want to measure or we go more explorative. We have, for example, mass spec data. We have a lot of candidates and then we need to prioritize uh, the biomarkers, um, which do we follow up in a more targeted approach, either with immune assays or also, for example, with MRM methods for mass spectrometry. And um, there are options to, for example, really important is to look at expression profile. Um, we can use protein atlas, DB proteomics to see where's my protein um, expressed, but also is it secreted? Is a membra membrane protein? All of that is important to know um, before you really dive into the development or implementation of novel assays um, of your proteins. And um, what do we then do? We first of all, okay, we decided on a protein and we check um, are there commercial assays available? Um, yeah, because why develop a new assay if there are good assays out there? So, okay, yes. And first of all, uh, still ELISAs are uh, the best way to start. They are cheap. They can be highly sensitive. They're with us with many years and they have um, absolutely their use. But uh, you have also already showed you they have some downsides, like um, they are more prone to human error, for example. So we have now, um, uh, luckily, also more um, automated platforms available. I have three here, which Hyratin also already also showed you the Simua technique from Quanterix, the MSD platform, and for example, um, the Ella platform, the Simpleplex Ella. And um, you will hear about that, um, or you already heard from Jürf, and you will hear more about that later. So um, still now um, we have an essay available, um, uh, commercially available. That's great, but still we have to test it. And uh, if it's running, uh, we have to validate it. And um, I will always get back to this point, validation. This is highly important, even if you buy uh, from a provider you trust, still validate the assay in your laboratory, in your surroundings. Um, this was really important also if you want to, for example, really implement this test uh, in the clinic. And um, however, sometimes there are no assays available, so you can uh, set up your own assays. Either you buy commercial antibodies or you produce your own. Um, this is, of course, also a question of uh, yeah economics. But uh, both is possible. But in the end, you will uh, you need to test those antibody pairs to set up, for example, in sandwich ELISA. But at the end, you will again end up at the validation um, where you really have to validate uh, your assay. If all of this is not working, you may really need to reconsider the technique and maybe more move to, for example, a mass spectrometry technique. If you then have the validated assay, you can really start to designing your study, uh, collect your samples and um, measure them. So now I want to dive into those examples um, I already uh, told you. So we measure the neurofilaments in our clinic in uh, more or less daily use. And um, of course, we want to measure them in blood. We measure them also in CSF, but we also, uh, of course, uh, like to see them in blood. And uh, so what we do um, at that time, 2017, 18, um, of course, we looked at other commercial assays available. Yes, there were at this time, the CMOA was the first to really have the assay for blood. Um, we cho chose that. And again, like I uh, showed before, we tested this assay and did a full validation in our laboratory and, and measured um, some ALS samples and some other uh, neurological diseases. Um, Hyratin already showed you this data. Um, we have also a big focus in our clinic on ALS patients, and you can see this um, high increase of uh, neurofilament light in serum in this case. So this was working um, for the implementation. Really in the clinic, we had to measure some more patients to really have... Uh, a high number to set a cutoff between ALS and controls um, and then set up a Q system. Um, but um, Hyratin also already showed you that reference values for age dependency are really important. I think the cutoff is still feasible for ALS versus controls. Other levels are so high in ALS. Um, but for other diseases, uh, you have to be really careful and uh, check the age 
range or have age reference values. So now um, this was actually uh, running quite good, but we uh, wanted to have a maybe a bit more feasible assay, a bit small benchtop machine, which we could use for the measurement um, in our routine. And we um, yeah, came upon the uh, Simplex Ella system at that time, um, around two years later. And um, we tested this assay again. We did the full validation. Um, and measured another big cohort this time directly also using the NFH cartridges. And we took a look at the CSF NFL and NFH and serum levels. And again, saw this high increase in ALS patients that was of course already uh, published, but um, also the CVs for intra assay variants and so were, were great. So we are moved uh, to the ELLA platform now where we now uh, daily or weekly measure our new filaments in the clinic. Of course, we had to set up a fresh cutoff um, to a fresh uh, um, uh, yeah, measurement of additional samples again, um, as we have a completely different method. Um, we also then internally compared the Simoa method to the ELLA um, NFL. Uh, this was never published, but you can see on the left side, a bigger cord and a, a smaller cord on the right side, which showing more or less the same results with them. R of zero uh, nine two, so really high correlation between those two essays. And you have also already showed you uh, this publication where the colleagues showed the same thing in MS samples. But on the uh, top left corner, you can also already see that the ELA values uh, in this publication were higher than the Simoa ones. So this again uh, puts the focus on that you really. Um, you cannot mix values from the two methods. You have to set up fresh cutoffs also if you, of course, uh, move to a different platform and revalidate everything. Um, so this is how it looks. You've seen that in all your presentations. We use the small benchtop machine. Um, I can also jump over this just again a reminder in those glass nanorectors, there's more or less a sandwich assay um, inside, and this will be important. Um, for our, our homemade um, essays, which I'd like to show you now. So you can have uh, the NFL measurements are uh, done, for example, in a single plex cartridge. Uh, there are also multiplex cartridges, but I want to uh, put your focus here on the right side on this customizable open cartridge format. You can see there are three wells now for one sample, and that's this because you can add your sample, of course, but then also capture in a detector antibody. The only thing is you have to digoxygenate your capture antibody and biotinylate the detector antibody. And um, in this way, you can either um, test several antibody combinations or, of course, um, up to 48 samples with one antibody combination of your choice. And um, this is what we used for uh, beta cyanuclein. But first, maybe a bit of a background to beta cyanuclein. This is a presynaptic marker. And um, we more or less have to, have to say stumbled upon this a bit as we were looking at alpha cyanuclein um, in uh, Parkinson's disease. You can see the results of this study here. This is a mass spec study. On the left side is alpha and on the right side, gamma cyanuclein. And beta cyanuclein, we are more or less uh, just uh, also measured uh, the pep specific peptides for beta cyanuclein in this assay. And we've seen a high increase in AD. And so we decided, okay, this could be really interesting to follow up. And um, But before we really moved into developing immunoassays, which of course is also uh, time consuming and uh, can be expensive, we, we did also some background check. And again, as I said, uh, we looked, for example, at the expression profile. And you can see this is data from the Protein Atlas uh, web page. You can see there's a high uh, specificity of beta cyanuclein for the brain, for the CNS. Um, which is, of course, then also really great if you later want to move to a blood assay. So your concentrations from the CNS more or less get not mixed up with all the peripheral um, expression, which is, um, yeah, not there for uh, beta cyanuclein. Um, so what did we do now? We first of all set up an ELISA. ELISAs, as I said, can be highly sensitive and um, they're, of course, cost effective. 
So um, as there was no commercial assay available, we set our own assay. We used commercial antibodies. In this case, we bought 10 antibodies and a recombinant protein. We tested different pairs together to set up a sandwich, ELISA, and then we validated this. I have now here the list uh, of validations we mostly do. It's not a full list, but quiet, I'd say. So we look for the matrix effects, importantness or parallelism, where we dilute CSF samples or serum samples. Um, uh, you do a spike in recovery, where you spike recombinant protein and see how much you can recover in your matrix of choice. Um, of course, we check the CVs between runs and within one run. We check specificity, for example, for um, IgGs or a cross-reaction of IgGs or with um, albumin. And of course, we also look at the uh, sensitivity and the protein stability, um, for example, after several freeze and thaw cycles. And um, we did this for better cyanoclin and, and could publish this, uh, I th would say, nice data on this ELISA with here in the red, uh, you can see the AD patients really highly increased levels in CSF. And um, we now use this um, antibody combination and move to a more sensitive platform to measure it in blood. As we did this also over really, uh, yeah, end of 2019, 20, uh, we took again the Simoa assay. And uh, as I said, we could just use our combination from the ELISA, which worked really great. Um, we coupled it to the beads, the capture antibody, which is used in the Simoa technique. The detector needed to be biotinylated. We tested this and then I put in the point optimization. It's a, a small item here, but this is the most of the work, you really need to optimize your assays if you want to measure them in blood, different buffers, different concentration, incubation times, uh, sample preparations, and so on. And then again, we validated this assay and we have some uh, nice results. Uh, here on the right side, for example, you can see uh, polytrauma patients directly in the emergency room um, you have a high increase of uh, plasma beta cyclin, which is dropping over time, and then in comparison to NFL here on the left side, where, which is rising over time, but has not that steep increase uh, directly after injury. And um, we are now at the moment um, trying to uh, set up an LI assay. Um, for this. And again, we can really uh, nicely again use the antibodies from the ELISA. Uh, we couple the antibodies to the digoxygen and um, by use a biotinylated detector antibody. And we test this run. And then also uh, with the LR platform, you have to do some optimizations. There are some buffers provided that you can check, but also the incubation time or the um, concentrations of your antibodies. And um, we are at this point right now, you see the standard curve looks actually quite okay, but there are some samples outside the linear range. We're still in the optimization phase um, to really set up um, this assay also on the ELA platform. And my last example will now focus on um, GFAP. It's an astrocytic marker, uh, which is really increased in, uh, uh, in, in brain injuries, um, high values, for example, in TBI patients, but also in AD. Um, and we know there's a Simor discovery assay available, but this showed some variance between runs. So you wanted to set up our own LR assay. Again, we uh, check the expression profile of GFAP. And again, you can see there's a high specificity uh, for the CNS, and um, which is, of course, also then really great if you want to measure it in blood. And um, yeah, I said this here, there's the Simor GFAP discovery kit. And, uh, but as I said, we are, we are not that happy with some variances here. So we want to set up our own LISA. We bought some antibodies again with recombinant protein. We tested this as an, in an ELISA first to find the best antibody combination. In this case, we did only a partial validation because we knew we wanted to directly move to the ELA system. And for that, we took our three best combinations from the ELISA. Um, as you can see here now, we have the three ELISA combinations. We uh, did the coupling to the digoxygen and then the biotinine. 
and uh, tested this. And then we, of course, needed to select one combination which works work best. And then we um, optimized further. I wrote this down here. We, we did the uh, coating detect and sample buffer. Um, this is second to the antibodies. Antibodies are your most important part of your immune assay. Um, you can optimize as much as you want if your antibodies are not uh, showing a good affinity to your antigen. Um, you will never get a sensitive assay. Um, but buffers can have a high influence, so we always test this first then. Um, also the concentrations, and we look, for example, also at the biotinylation ratio. And um, then we did the validation, and I have some uh, results for you for the validation. Um, the parallelism results are not here, but we found a, a nice decrease in signal and the parallelism. So for CSF and serum, we decided on those um, uh, dilutions you see here, and we see a real nice uh, recovery in CSF of 97%, and also great in serum of 85%. I would say between 80 and 120% is um, highly acceptable. Um, the variance was below 10% in the intra CV and below 15 in the inter assay, which is also good. And uh, absolutely no signal um, for human serum albumin or IgG, which um, uh, I think is really important to test because together they uh, account for around 60% of um, the protein uh, concentrations um, in blood. Um, of course, finally, we also measured uh, a small cohort. Uh, you can see here on the left side, CSF uh, patients uh, or samples from AD patients and controls in the same age range where you have higher values and also for serum in the middle, um, definitely a big difference between the 80s and the controls. Um, and finally, we did a correlation with the Simoa assay, which as you can see also correlates really well. And with that, I'm also um, um, finished. I have a small uh, summary, more or less four points to take home. Um, if you really like to go for a new assay set up, you have to really check your protein first. How, how is the expression looking like? For example, looking at the protein atlas data. Um, always validate your assay, even if the provider states uh, this was validated in here. That's, that's great, of course. And often then that's also working in your lab, uh, but sometimes not so really validated in your environment. And um, ELISA is a really good and cheap way to start de developing your assay. So you can use those combinations working in the ELISA in the sandwich then and move to the automated platforms. And never forget, in the end, the, auto the antibodies are the most important part of your assay. And with this, I'd like to really thank uh, the whole team and uh, uh, you for your attention. Thank you very much. Great. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Helga Gower, for your presentation. And another thank you to our speakers, the rest of them here. Let's get them on camera. Here we go. Thank you to all of our speakers here for your informative presentations. Um, before we conclude, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in one final poll question here. So I'll get this displayed. Would you like a biotechni immunoassay specialist to follow up with you? So please submit your answer there. And while you're submitting that, I'd like to again thank our speakers for their time today and their important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Biotechni, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. As we did not have time for questions today, those questions submitted during this session and during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>